Okay, well, um, I'm Whit Waldo. I'm the founder and CEO of a startup called Inovian. Uh, I architect, build custom software for you know anyone that needs it. Provide technical help to uh, you know companies looking for any kind of extra technical perspective. Uh, I focus on building distributed, complex software applications. Uh, my apps mostly run on Azure and Google's cloud uh, platform. I write C sharp, F sharp. As of October, I'm the, the newest .NET SDK maintainer for Dapper, so that's been very exciting. Uh, I've built several applications using Dapper that, that run in production, several that are pre-production, and so today I, I guess I just kind of want, want to t walk through you know, why I like using Dapper and what, what was appealing about it to me, and kind of show you some, uh, some blueprints, some patterns of uh, you know, kind of showing a, a more a richer take on how to use Dapper in your applications than necessarily our samples have. Uh, so uh, I guess who in here has used Dapper? We've, we've seen uh, a couple of slides, so you know, a couple of people talk about Dapper. Who's actually used it? Okay, wow, not a whole lot. Great, I'm glad I included the slide. So Dapper is itself a framework that helps with microservice development. So it is not a deployment framework itself. It is made for application development. Uh, it's comprised of a bunch of uh, building blocks. So you've got, uh, here I brought a laser pointer, but I'm a little bit too far forward to use it. So I'm gonna try to use my computer. Uh, it's got a bunch of building blocks. It's got workflows, actors. Uh, it can use PubSub. Uh, it itself is not providing these capabilities. It is an abstraction for the other service providers that do that. So if you're using, you know, if you need PubSub and you want to use Kafka, you want to use, you know, Jetstream, uh, you know, you can use Dapper to write the, you know, um, to actually build your application itself. You know, write once against Dapper. Dapper, hand, uh, Dapper hand, handles the abstraction to each of these other providers so that you write it once, you can swap out, you know, what you're actually using under the hood. You have a little bit more flexibility. So if you want to use Azure Blob Storage, you want to use Redis to store your state, um, you know, doesn't really matter. Swap out the configuration and you're good to go. So uh, Dapper shines in kind of six key domains that I'm going to kind of go through. Uh, you know, like I said, you, you write your application one time, uh, depending on what uh, components you need and what environment, you're going to swap them out. You know, if, if, you're, if you need to authenticate using environment variables locally uh, to use Redis, you know, you can uh, specify those. If you need to authenticate in the cloud using uh, credentials that you're pulling off of Key Vault, you know, drop that in. Again, swap it out for where, whatever environment. You don't have to change anything about your software. Uh, the, uh, it's uh, very scalable, so it uses a pluggable service discovery. Again, all these components are pluggable. Swap in, swap out, wherever you need. Uh, and so, you know, Dapper's useful to just say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm scaling up, I'm scaling out. Uh, where is my service located? You don't really have to worry about it. You know, specify the name of the service you're trying to connect to. Dapper will figure out how to discover it. So it's, it's useful. Uh, it's uh, very resilient. It's language agnostic. So Dapper is um, a, a polyglot framework. There's SDKs for Rust, Java. Again, I handle .NET. Um, and uh, you know, if your service goes down, you have a burst of unexpected activity. Dapper is able to provide some, some resiliency policies to just kind of in, ensure that um, uh, you, you can gracefully retry those operations. Uh, Dapper itself is written in Go. There's a Go SDK, um, but it's, it's very interoperable. Uh, you can, uh, for example, write your actors in .NET over here in a different service, write some actors in Java, and they can interact with each other. The, under the hood, it's uh, using HTTP and gRPC APIs. So there it's, you know, all, all the SDKs are just a, a wrapper abstracting that, so. Uh, and of course, it's, it's secure. You can uh, secure uh, service discovery with X509 certificates. You can require an authentication token for requests going to Dapper itself or requests coming back to your application. Um, there's a building block for retrieving secrets pr from providers. Uh, you can, uh, 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 I guess it provides cryptography operations if you need to do encryption, decryption. Uh, again, you know, it's, it's all just a matter of specify which providers is that you want to use. And then, you know, finally, it's, it's very flexible. It, it helps prevent any kind of vendor lock-in. You can host it wherever. Again, I mostly host my applications on Azure, 
Uh, and I've got things that have run on AWS and GCP. It, it doesn't matter. Again, it's, it's the application level. It's not a deployment. So deploy where you will. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it can make your application uh, more um, flexible. You know, if you, have, if you find that, you know, for, depending on how you're using it, you know, swapping a, a state provider you know, is more cost effective, more performant. Again, on Dapper, you don't have to change your application, swap out the component, good to go. And at the end of the day, you know, if you really, really need something that's not available in the Dapper SDK, there's a lot of components covered. If you need it, go use their SDK. You know, Dapper's opt-in, so you're, you're not locked into Dapper for, you know, everything under the hood. Uh, and so at that point, I guess uh, I'm going to go kind of spend the rest of the time going through patterns. We have a, a lot of examples. Uh, the, each of the SDKs themselves detail uh, a lot of examples. We have samples throughout the documentation. There's a number of quick starts. Uh, but they all tend to kind of focus on you want to use PubSub. Here's an example. You want to store state. Here's an example. And so what I, I guess I want to focus on was kind of pulling some patterns, kind of showing how the different pieces of Dapper can kind of be a little bit more um, you know, it just kind of use more of the building blocks in, you know, kind of more real-world solutions. So these are uh, patterns extracted from the applications that I've written. Uh, we're going to start with kind of user registration, um, and then uh, I guess we've kind of got four kind of paths here. We'll look at uh, some data aggregation, how we might uh, handle visualization refreshes, uh, handle a service status. You know, people want to see if uh, your application's still up and then kind of look at uh, an invoicing pipeline that I built. Uh, so we'll start with user registration. Again, I wish I had a little laser pointer, but I'll, I'll try and use my mouse here to kind of do the same thing. Uh, so user under registration, um, I guess another caveat, I uh, want to put all these things on one slide, so it's not quite as, as linear as I was hoping for, but I also wanted everyone to be able to read it. So we'll kind of start over here and slowly meander our way to the right side. So uh, user registration, you know, uh, there's a great many aspects of writing software that are just workflows. You know, you, you, you aren't necessarily saying, you know, do this thing and you're done. It's really kind of do one thing, do something else, do something else. So user registration, you have some kind of an app that has received the, uh, the, the login information. You're doing some kind of validation checking against it. Uh, but you know, I'll, I'll want to persist that to storage. Again, you can kind of store it wherever it is that you want uh, and validate it. You know, it's, it. There's a great many people I've found that will sign up for your service and then you'll never hear from them again. Uh, that's, that's fine. You know, for the, those that do uh, respond to the validation, um, great. They'll, they'll uh, click the, the validation link. We'll wait for the user. Uh, Dapper has actor support. You know, one, one of the most useful parts of actors for me is kind of the remind capability in this case. It lets you take, uh, you know, someone's valid, you send, you send email and say, I want to validate your email address. They don't respond. That, that's great, you know, some people don't get the first email. Maybe I want to send another one in an hour, maybe the next day. And that's where I can use uh, Dapper actors and just say, you know, here's, here's an actor spun up for this registration, uh, you know, uh, in, in a day, in, you know, three days. Uh, send a reminder, uh, use a binding to send the email through SendGrid. Again, you can swap that out and use a different provider if you need to. Uh, when they click the link, that just, you know, goes to another service. Uh, and workflows in Dapper support waiting for external events. So you, you, you write them like you would any class, top to bottom, uh, but you can have them pause and uh, you know, wait for, in, in this case, for a user to, uh, to validate their email address. That comes back, it pulls the registration data from storage that originally saved, sends a welcome email, done, pushes that to a message broker for anyone to subscribe to to say, what do I do if there's a, a new user in the system? Um, yeah, uh, we can look at invoice generation next. So invoices, uh, you know, I, I send those out usually on the first of the month. 
And this is a useful thing. So in, in uh, version 1.14 of Dapper, uh, we released the, the jobs and scheduler API. And that's really kind of useful to say you, you want to schedule some activity to happen on a, a cron-based schedule or you know, variations. Uh, the, uh, and so we're, we're, we're kind of going to do that here. So say on the first, first day of the month, um, uh, the well, uh, hmm. uh, first day of the month, uh, we kick off an operation. It's uh, a job is invoked. Says you know start the billing cycle. Uh, it calls the invoice service. So the invoice service is going to need information about the customer in order to populate you know what's at the top. Uh, you know the name of the customer, their address, phone number, etc. Uh, that kicks off a workflow that uh, builds out the file itself, generates a PDF, saves that to blob storage. And so then the URL of that is returned back to the service. Uh, and that is what, you know, is, is uh, it, 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 I guess it, it's triggering the operation of, um, you know, the, the, the file has been saved. Uh, it's time to kick off the rest of the, the uh, billing setup. So kind of a, a simple flow, but then you've got payment processing. You know, so we've got some kind of a payment instrument that is assigned to each customer. Now, you know, they sign up for an account, they've saved their credit information. Uh, and again, we're gonna, that's, that's its own little workflow. So we'll start here, we'll say, you know, find that customer. We're gonna pull that customer's information out of storage. And we're gonna check their, their card. You know, there's, a, it, there's often a, um, a fee attached if you run someone's credit card and it fails to process. So one of the, the things we can easily check right off, off the bat is, is the date valid on this thing? If the date's not valid, send them an email. Again, we're, we're gonna wait for the user to respond and say, you know, uh, my bad, you know, let me update my payment information. And then it's just gonna start that over again. So again, you, you can, it's, it's um, it's, it's, it's a way of uh, scheduling a, a more comprehensive workflow that you know may just need to be canceled and just restarted at a later time. Uh, if it's if it's valid, you know we'll charge the card again. If it's invalid, you know start uh, go go down this other pipeline again. Send another email. Wait for the user. Uh, kick off another actor. So it's uh, again you make use of the reminders to say you know uh, uh, the maybe the, the card failed. We're going to send them another email in an hour, you know, in a, the next day, the next week, just to let you know, hey, your payment failed, and your balance is increasingly due. Uh, and then finally, of course, uh, you've got to generate a receipt. If, so the, if the charge card is successful, uh, generate a receipt. We'll look at that on the next slide. And in the workflow. Uh, again, this, this is one of those things that, um, you know, we, we can use the scheduling service. So when we set up a new customer, we could say, um, you know, a customer, uh, is, you know, we're, we want to check their card on the last day of every month. So again, we can, we can do the first couple of these steps without necessarily waiting and triggering them all on the first of the month. You know, we could say, you know, the last week of the month, kind of distribute them, pick a, a random day in the last day of the month. Next month, will this card be expired? And, uh, you know, kind of give them a little heads up of that before this whole operation fails. Um, so receipt generation. Just another workflow. So uh, again, the, uh, I guess what the point I'm trying to get across, you have a, potentially a lot of different steps. Uh, you, you want to represent them kind of simply, and you know, workflows are good for that. So again, you know, you'll, you'll start the workflow, get information about what is being generated here. You know, in, in this case, I've got the URL that I uh, persisted to the blob storage pointing to my receipt. Um, uh, or I guess, uh, unfortunately, this, this uh, in this uh, shot, you know, maybe generated it again, persisted to a CDN so it's accessible. Um, email that to the customer. Again, use the SendGrid binding to do that. Uh, you know, persist a, a timestamp indicating when it is that I sent that. You know, save all that to storage. You know, maybe there's a, a, a email notification. You know, uh, uh, if someone's uh, you know read the email, if someone has uh, uh, otherwise uh, you know perceived it, and then end. So. You know, kind of straightforward workflows. Uh, report visualization. So I don't tend to use um, uh, really complicated uh, reporting on a lot of my systems, but I, I need some way that someone looks at a report and they, um, 
you know, can, can get the most uh, recent information without necessarily rerunning the job right off the bat. Uh, I find there's another great use for actors. So actors, you know, you can set up these uh, refresh periods uh, and say, you know, here's some, some report. The report consists of a bunch of visualizations. Those visualizations are pulling data from somewhere. Uh, um, you know, they, they per perhaps need to authenticate it something, pull those secrets off those secret stores. And in the actors themselves, you know, maybe once an hour, once a day, uh, whatever the interval is that someone needs to pull information uh, to populate their report, you know, do, do that query. You know, cache that somewhere so that, you know, when a user comes by on the front end, wants to view this report, uh, you know, they're loading the cache data. You know, hit, hit your uh, data source. You know, it, it, this doesn't necessarily work if people need real-time data, of course. If, if, but if they're okay having cached data, something that may you know, be an hour old, a day old, there's a way to at least reduce the load on your, your server uh, and uh, just you know, make use of caching. And finally, uh, I, I'm sorry, there's two left. Uh, so uh, data aggregation, again, um, great, uh, I, I use this uh, in, in my application. You know, data comes into some kind of an endpoint. Um, as it comes in, you know, here's kind of an example shape of what it would look like. Goes into a, a topic broker. All the different services that are expecting to receive this information uh, get a copy of this data, and it's, uh, it, it, it processes. You now, for example, if you have um, uh, in a more multi-tenant setting, data comes into the system. Customer A over here uh, needs to process this data. Customer B needs to process their data. Uh, you may have separate services set up for each of those customers, uh, and each you know each of them will apply uh, some kind of a filter to the uh, the inbound messages, handle that data uh, as they complete processing that, push that out to uh, a queue, and the queue essentially is just going to represent here's here's all the finished products they need to be stored somewhere, uh, maybe maybe aggregated you know maybe maybe it's information that I need to display here's what's happened in the last minute you know if it's uh, doing some kind of error detection or saying, you know, a more, a more anomaly detection. You know, here's, here's anomalies that have been seen in the last, you know, minute, last hour, or last, you know, whatever. You know, persist those to storage, uh, and, you know, you, you can apply partitioning in this. You can apply, um, you know, kind of break it up however you want. But again, it's, it, Dapper's great at saying, you know, it, it doesn't really matter what, what providers is that you're using under the hood to split this thing out. It's more represent what the pattern is that you're trying to express and write that workflow for it. <clears throat> uh, and then finally, again, service statuses. You know, very, kind of similar to um, uh, one of the slides a couple slides back. But uh, if, uh, again, you can use, there's a bunch of third parties that will, of course, have some functionality like this. Uh, but again, this is a great use for actors. You know, you utilize the reminder to say, I've created this service over here register it with a, an actor that is going to check on it every five minutes. Uh, every five minutes, it's going to trigger a check against that service, see if it's live. You know, maybe you have your actor deployed to a bunch of different regions, so you can check them from all these different regions. Uh, if uh, the service ch uh, the status check has failed, you know, send me an email. I, I want to know about it first, um, uh, so I can ideally handle it before the customer notices that something's a problem. Uh, and then otherwise cache it, you know, so I, I think it's nice to have uh, uh, exposure into, you know, hey, here's, here's what my actual uptime has been as validated by my, my own software. You know, you can see the, the kind of the status check. And, uh, and then otherwise save them because I want to know if, if something's been failing consistently in one region, I, I want to know about it. Um, and uh, I think that's it. I think I'm out of time. So thanks for having me. Um, Happy to answer any questions if you have them. Otherwise, uh, I'll be around all week. Yeah. So, what kind of skill sets needed to get started with the app? Not many. <laughs> I mean, so it, it's it's it's. Oh uh, yeah, I'm sorry. So the question was, uh, what what kind of skill sets are needed to start with Dapper? And uh, again, Dapper is a uh, an application level thing. So uh, we have a number of quick starts on, you know, you, you, we've we've got a CLI that can install the the Dapper container itself. And then otherwise, if, if, if you want to just interact with it via HTTP, you can do that. There's, there's APIs for that. The language wrappers themselves are just wrapping the capabilities on the Dapper, on Dapper itself. So Dapper is a sidecar. 
So when you deploy your application, Dapper is running as a sidecar alongside it, and your, your application is essentially using the SDKs or, or not to talk to that sidecar. So it's pretty straightforward. Anything else? Oh, great. Yeah, I guess you mind walking up to the mic? Hello. Uh, yeah. Oh. Hey. Hi. Mic check. Good. All right. So I have a Java, Quarkus, Kafka Streams application. Okay. Right now, for local development, I am deploying, you know, everything either to uh, Docker Compose on my laptop or Minikube if I want to, like, demo a full kind of environment, like sure. cloud environment workload to whoever needs to see it. What are the gotchas if I were to switch and use Dapper during that migration? Hard to say. I'm not a, J a Java developer. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe more generally, just maybe migrating from running. More Kafka. generally, I mean, I guess you know, if I, I would look first to see, make sure that we have a component for you. You know, so uh, whatever the providers there are you have under the hood, we have a lot of components for a lot of the different building blocks, but we don't have all of them. Okay. So I'd first check to make sure that you've got them. Again, if, if we have 80% of them and you need to use your own SDK for one of the other ones, go for it. You know, again, Dapper's opt-in. So if, if you're using Dapper and we don't have it, that's fine. And would that be an opportunity for us to create it? If you want to, yeah, yeah. If, especially if you know Go. All, all, okay. the, all the components themselves are written in Go. There, are, there is a pluggable SDK that some of the languages have support for, .NET in particular, uh, so that you can write them in your own language, especially if you want to write a component that you don't necessarily want to publicly share. It's, it's a way to kind of privately host your own components. And um, yeah. Awesome. So, yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you very much for coming, and uh, it was great talking with you.